Good afternoon. Nietzsche wasn't the first one to discover that there were issues within the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, the doubts had been building up for uh, a couple of centuries, probably, and Ralph Waldo Emerson spoke to the graduating class of Divinity College at Harvard University on July 15th, 1838 and he gave a lot of new ideas about religion in that address. Probably not too many people heard about it until uh, many years later because people weren't getting access to things like this in those days. And so today I'm going to read it to you. Uh, it's rather long. I'll be stopping uh, every time my eyes won't focus anymore and looking at your comments, but otherwise I'm going to blast right through because it's a 19-page document. So, um, Divinity School Address, delivered before the senior class in Divinity College, Cambridge, Sunday evening, July 15, 1838. In this refulgent summer, it has been a luxury to draw the breath of life. The grass grows, the buds burst, the meadow is spotted with fire and gold in the tint of flowers. The air is full of birds and sweet with the breath of pine, the palm of Gilead and the new hay. Night brings no gloom to the heart with its welcome shade. Through the transparent darkness, the stars pour their almost spiritual rays. Man, under them, seems a young child and his huge globe of a toy. The cool light bathes the world as with a river and prepares his eyes again. for the crimson dawn. The mystery of nature was never displayed more happily. The corn and the wine have been freely dealt all creatures, and the never broken silence which the old bounty and the never broken silence which and the never broken silence with which the old bounty goes forward has not yielded yet one word of explanation. One is constrained to respect the perfection of this world in which our senses converse. How wide, how rich, what invitation from every property it gives to every faculty of man. In its fruitful soils, in its navigable sea, in its mountains of metal and stone, in its forests of all woods, in its animals, in its chemical ingredients, in the powers and path of light, heat, attraction, and life. It is well worth the pith and heart of great men to subdue and enjoy it. The planters, the mechanics, the inventors, the astronomers, the builders of cities and captains, history delights to honor. But when the mind opens and reveals the laws which traverse the universe and makes things what they are, then shrinks the great world at once into mere illustration and fable of this mind. What am I? And what is? asks the human spirit with a curiosity new kindled, but never to be quenched. Behold these outrunning laws, which our imperfect apprehension can see tend this way and that, but not come full circle. Behold these infinite relations, so like, so unlike, many yet one. I would study, I would know, I would admire forever. These works of thought have been the entertainments of the human spirit in all ages. 
a more secret, sweet, and overpowering beauty appears to man when his heart and mind open to the sentiment of virtue. Then he is instructed in what is above him. He learns that his being is without bound, that to the good, to the perfect, he is born. Lo, as he now lies in evil, in weakness. That which he invetera that which he venerates is still his own, though he has not realized it yet. He ought. He knows the sense of that grand word, though his analysis fails entirely to render account of it. When in innocency, or when by intellectual perception he attains to say, I love the right, truth is beautiful within and without, forevermore. Virtue, I am thine. Save me. Use me. Thee will I serve, day and night, in great, in small, that I may be not virtuous, but virtue. Then is the end of the creation answered, and God is well pleased. The sentiment of virtue is a reverence and delight in the presence of certain divine laws. It perceives that this homely game of life we play covers under what seem foolish details principles that astonish. The child amidst his baubles is learning the action of light, motion, gravity, muscular force, and in the game of human life, love, fear, justice, appetite, man, and God interact. These laws refuse to be adequately stated. They will not be written out on paper or spoken by the tongue. They elude our persevering thought, yet we read them hourly in each other's faces, in each other's actions, in our own remorse. The moral traits which are all globed into every virtuous act and thought. In speech we must sever and describe or suggest by painful enumeration of many particulars. Yet as this sentiment is the essence of all religion, let me guide your eye to the precise objects of the sentiment by an enumeration of some of those classes of facts in which this element is conspicuous. The intuition of moral sentiment is an insight of the perfection of the laws of the soul. These laws execute themselves. They are out of time, out of space, and not subject to circumstance. Thus, in the soul of man, there is a justice whose retributions are instant and entire. He who does a good deed is instantly ennobled. He who does a mean deed is by the action itself contracted. He who puts off impurity thereby puts on purity. If a man is at heart just, then in so far then in so far is he God, the safety of God, the immortality of God, the mass the majesty of God do enter into that man with justice. If a man dissemble, deceive, he deceives himself and goes out of acquaintance with his own being. A man in the view of absolute goodness adores with total humility. Every step so downward is a step upward. The man who renounces himself comes to himself. See how this rapid intrinsic energy worketh everywhere writing wrongs, correcting appearances, and bringing up facts to a harmony with thoughts. In operation in life, though, slow to the senses is, at last, as sure as in the soul. By it, a man is made the providence to himself, dispensing good to his goodness and evil to his sin. Character is always known. Thefts never enrich, alms never impoverish, murder will speak out of stone walls. 
the least admixture of a lie, for example, the taint of vanity, the least attempt to make a good impression, a favorable appearance, will instantly vitiate the effect. But speak the truth, and all nature and all spirits help you with unexpected furtherance. Speak the truth, and all things alive or brute are vouchers, and the very roots of the grass underground there do seem to stir and move to bear you witness. See again the perfection of the law as it applies itself to the affections and becomes the law of society. As, as we are, so we associate. The good, by affinity, seek the good. The vile, by affinity, the vile. Thus, of their own volition, souls proceed into heaven and into hell. These facts have always suggested to man the sublime creed that the world is not the product of manifold power, but of one will, of one mind, and that one mind is everywhere active, in each ray of the star, in each wavelet of the pool, and whatever opposes that will is everywhere balked and baffled, because things are made so and not otherwise, good is positive. All evil is so much death or non-entity. Benevolence is absolute and real. So much be benevolence as a man hath, so much life hath he. For all things proceed out of this same spirit, which is differently named love, justice, temperance, in its different applications. Just as the ocean receives different names on the several shores which it washes, all things proceed out of the same spirit, and all things conspire with it. Whilst a man seeks good ends, he is strung by the whole strength of nature. Insofar as he roves from these ends, he bereaves himself of power, of auxiliaries. His being shrinks out of all remote channels. He becomes less and less, a moat, a point, until absolute badness is absolute death. The perception of this law of laws awakens in the mind a sentiment, which we call the religious sentiment, and which makes our highest happiness. Wonderful is its power to charm and to command. It is a mountain air. It is the embalmer of the world. It is myrrh and storax and chlorine and rosemary. It makes the sky and the hills sublime, and the silent sound of the stars is it. By it is the universe made and habitable, not by science or power. Thought may work cold and intransitive into things and find no end of unity, but the dawn of the sentiment of virtue on the heart gives and is assurance that law is sovereign over all natures, and the world's time, space, eternity do seem to break out into joy. This sentiment is divine and deifying. It is the beatitude of man. It makes him illimitable. Through it, the soul first knows itself. It corrects the capital mistake of the infant man, who seeks to be great by following the great and hopes to derive advantages from another. By showing the fountain of all good to be in himself and that he, equally with every man, is an inlet into the deeps of reason. When he says, I ought, when love warms him, when he chooses, worn from on high, the good and the great deed, then deep melodies wander through his soul from supreme wisdom. Then he can worship and be enlarged by his worship, for he can never go behind this sentiment. In the sublimest flights of soul, rectitude is never surmounted. Love is never outgrown. This sentiment lies at the foundation of society and successively creates all forms of worship. The principle of veneration never dies out. 
man fallen into superstition, into sensuality, is never quite without the visions of the moral sentiment. In like manner, all the expressions of this sentiment are sacred and permanent in proportion to their purity. The expressions of this sentiment affect us more than all other compositions. The sentences of the oldest time which ejaculate this piety are still fresh and fragrant. This thought dwelled always deepest in the minds of men in the devout and contemplative East, not alone in Palestine, where it reached its purest expression, but in Egypt, in Persia, in India, in China. Europe has always owed to, your, to Oriental genius its divine impulses. What these holy bards said, all sane men found agreeable and true, and the unique impression of Jesus upon mankind, whose name is not so much written as plowed into history of this world, is proof of the subtle virtue of this infusion. Meantime, whilst the doors of the temple stand open night and day before every man and the oracles of this truth cease never, it is guarded by one stern condition. This, namely, it is an intuition. It cannot be received at second hand. Truly speaking, it is not instruction, but provocation that I can receive from another soul. What he announces, I must find true in me, or wholly reject and on his word, or has his second be he who he may, be he who he may, I can accept nothing. On the contrary, the absence of this primary faith is the presence of degradation. As is the flood, so is the ebb. Let this faith depart, and the very words it spake, and the things it made, become false and hurtful. Then falls the church, the state, art, letters, life, the doctrine of the divine nature being forgotten, a sickness infects and dwarfs the constitution. Once man was all, now he is an appendage, a nuisance. And because the indwelling Supreme Spirit cannot wholly be got rid of, the doctrine of it suffers this perversion, that the divine nature is attributed to one or two persons, and denied to all the rest, and denied with fury. The doctrine of inspiration is lost. The base doctrine of the majority of voices usurps the place of the doctrine of the soul. Miracles, prophecy, poetry, the ideal life, the holy life, exist as ancient history merely. They are not in the belief nor in the aspiration of society, but when suggested, seem ridiculous. Life is comic and pitiful as soon as the high ends of being fade out of sight, and man becomes nearsighted and can only attend to what addresses the senses. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm glad that's helpful. Yeah, or not? It's a long. It's a long uh, piece. So, if someone comes in in the middle there, <laughs> they really need to know what's going on. Okay. Hi, everyone else. Joseph and Martin. Um, wait a minute. This thing has got top chat set. Okay. All right. I've reset this so that live chat is showing, not just top chat, uh, because last time I wasn't getting the chats at all. I, uh, if someone will just say hello on the chat now, so I know that you've got the chat going, uh, I will continue. These general views, which whilst they are general, none will contest, 
find abundant illustration in the history of religion, and especially in the history of the Christian Church, in that all of us have had our birth and nurture. The truth contained in that, you, my young friends, are now setting forth to teach as the cultus or established worship of the civilized world, it has great historical interest for us of its blessed words, which have been the consolation of humanity. You need not that I should speak. Shall I endeavor to discharge my duty to you on this occasion by pointing out two errors in its administration, which daily appear more gross from the point of view we have just now taken. Jesus Christ belonged to the true race of prophets. He saw with open eye the mystery of the soul. Drawn by its severe harmony, ravished with its beauty, he lived in it and had his being there. Alone in all history, he estimated the greatness of man. One man was true to what is in you and me. He saw that God incarnates himself in man and evermore goes forth anew to take possession of his world. He said in this jubilee of sublime emotion, I am divine. Through me, God acts. Through me, speaks. Would you see God, see me, or see thee, when thou also thinkest as I now think? But what a distortion did his doctrine and memory suffer in the same, in the next, and the following ages. There is no doctrine of the reason which will bear to be taught by the understanding. The understanding caught this high chant from the poet's lips and said in the next age, this was Jehovah come down out of heaven. I will kill you if you say he was a man. The idioms of his language and the figures of his rhetoric have usurped the place of his truth, and churches are not built on his principles, but on his tropes. Christianity became a myth. Christianity became a mythos as the poetic teacher, teaching of Greece and Egypt before. He spoke of miracles, for he felt that man's life was a miracle, and all that man doth, and he knew that this daily miracle shines as the character ascends. But the word miracle, as pronounced by Christian churches, gives a false impression. It is a monster. It is not one with the blowing clover and the falling rain. He felt respect for Moses and the prophets, but no unfit tenderness at postponing their initial revelations to the hours, the man that now is, to the eternal revelation in the heart. Thus was he a true man, having seen that the law in us is commanding. He would not suffer it to be commanded. Boldly, with hand and heart and life, he declared it was God. This is he, as I think, the only soul in history who has appreciated the worth of a man. One, in this point of view, we become very sensible to the first defect of historical Christianity. Historical Christianity has fallen into the error that corrupts all attempts to communicate religion. As it appears to us, and as it appeared for ages, it is not the doctrine of the soul, but an exaggeration of the personal, the positive, the ritual. It has dwelt, it dwells, with noxious, with noxious exaggeration about the person of Jesus. The soul knows no persons. It invites every man to expand to the full circle of the universe and will have no preferences but those of spontaneous love. But by this Eastern monarchy of a Christianity, which indolence and fear have built, the friend of man is made the injurer of man. The manner in which his name is surrounded with expressions, 
which were once sallies of admiration and love, but are now petrified into official titles, kills all generous sympathy and liking. All who hear me feel that the language that describes Christ to Europe and America is not the style of friendship and enthusiasm to a good and noble heart, but is appropriated and formal, paints a demigod as the Orientals or the Greeks would describe Osiris or Apollo. Accept the injurious impositions of our early catechetical instruction, and even honesty and self-denial were but splendid sins if they did not wear the Christian name. One would rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn than to be defrauded of his manly right in coming into nature and finding not names and places, not land and professions, but even virtue and truth foreclosed and monopolized. You shall not be a man even. You shall not own the world. You shall not dare and live after the infinite law that is in you and in company with the infinite beauty which heaven and earth reflect to you in all lovely forms. But you must subordinate your nature to Christ's nature, who must accept our interpretations and take his portrait as the vulgar draw it. That is always best which gives me to myself. The sublime is excited in me by the great stoical doctrine. Obey thyself. That which shows God in me fortifies me. That which shows God out of me makes me a wart and a wen. There is no longer a necessary reason for my being. Already the long shadows of untimely oblivion creep over me, and I shall decrease forever. The divine bards are the friends of my virtue, of my intellect, of my strength. They admonish me that the gleams which flash across my mind are not mine but God's, that they had the like and were not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So I love them. Noble provocations go out from them, inviting me to resist evil, to subdue the world and to be. And thus, by his holy thoughts, Jesus serves us and thus only. To name to certain to name to convert a man by miracles is a, profan is a profanation of the soul. A true conversion, a true Christ, is now, as always, to be made by the reception of beautiful sentiments. It is true that a great and rich soul, like his, falling among the simple, does so preponderate that, as his did, it names the world. The world seems to them to exist for him, and they have not yet drunk so deeply of his sense as to see that only by coming again to themselves or to God in themselves can they grow forevermore. It is a low benefit to give me something. It is a high benefit to enable me to do somewhat of myself. The time is coming when all men will see that the gift of God to the soul is not a vaunting, overpowering, excluding sanctity, but a sweet, natural goodness, a goodness like thine and mine, and that so invites thine and mine to be and to grow. The injustice of the vulgar tone of preaching is not less flagrant to Jesus than to the souls which it profanes. The preachers do not see that they make his gospel not glad and shear him of the locks of beauty and the attributes of heaven. When I see a majestic Empinadas or Washington, when I see among my contemporaries a true orator, an upright judge, a dear friend, when I vibrate to the melody and fancy of a poem, I see beauty that is to be desired and so lovely and with yet more entire consent of my human being sounds in my ear the severe music of the bards 
that have sung of the true God in all ages. Now do not degrade the life and dialogues of Christ out of the circle of his charm by insulation and peculiarity. Let them lie as they befell, alive and warm, part of human life and of the landscape and of the cheerful day. Okay, let's take a brief break here. Thank you, Granada. Uh, right, Martin, I'm sorry, YouTube has quite a delay. I have noticed that. <laughs> uh, I hope it's not too distracting. I am on page 9 of 19, just for the record here. 2. The second defect of the traditionary and limited way of using the mind of Christ is a consequence of the first, this namely, that the moral nature, that laws of law, law of laws, whose revelations introduce greatness, yea, God himself, into the open soul, is not explored as the fountain of the established teaching in society. Men have come to speak of the revelation as somewhat long ago given and done, as if God were dead. The injury of faith throttles the preacher, and the, good, and the goodliness of institutions becomes an uncertain and inarticulate voice. It is very certain that it is the effect of conversation with the beauty of the soul to beget a desire, a need to impart to others the same knowledge and love. If utterance is denied, the thoughtful lies like a burden on the man. Always the seer is a sayer. Somehow his dream is told. Somehow he publishes it with solemn joy, sometimes with pencil on canvas, sometimes with chisel on stone, sometime in towers and aisles of granite. His soul's worship is builded, sometimes in anthems of indefinite music, but clearest and most permanent in words. The man enamored of this excellency becomes its priest or poet. The office is coeval with the world, but observe the condition, the spiritual limitation of the office. The spirit only can teach, not any profane man, not any sensual, not any liar, not any slave can teach, but only he can give, who has, he only can create who is, the man on whom the soul descends, through whom the soul speaks, alone can teach courage, piety, love, wisdom, can teach. And every man can open his door to these angels, and they shall bring him the gift of tongues. But the man who aims to speak as books enable, as synods use, as the fashion guides, and as interest commands, babbles, let him hush. To this holy office you propose to devote yourselves. I wish you may feel your call in throbs of desire and hope. The office is the first in the world. It is of that reality that it cannot suffer the deduction of any falsehood. And it is my duty to say to you that the need was never greater of new revelation than now. From the views I have already expressed, you will infer the sad conviction which I share, I believe, with numbers of the universal decay and now almost death of faith in society. The soul is not preached. The church seems to totter to its fall, almost all life extinct. On this occasion, any complacence would be criminal, which told you whose hope and commission it is to preach the faith of Christ. It is time that this ill-suppressed murmur of all thoughtful men against the famine of our churches 
this moaning of the heart because it is bereaved of this consolation, the hope, the grandeur that come alone out of the culture of the moral nature should be heard through the sleep of indolence and over the din of routine. This great and perpetual office of the preacher is not discharged. Preaching is the expression of the moral sentiment in application to the duties of life. In how many teaches, I'm sorry, in how many churches, by how many prophets, tell me, is man made sensible that he is an infinite soul, that the earth and heavens are passing into his mind, that he is drinking forever the soul of God? Where now sounds the persuasion that by its very melody imparadises my heart and so affirms its own origin in heaven? Where shall I hear words such as the elder ages drew men to leave all and follow? Father and mother, house and land, wife and child, where shall I hear these august laws of moral being so pronounced as to fill my ear and I feel ennobled by the offer of my uttermost action and passion? The test of the true faith, certainly, should be its power to charm and command the soul as the laws of nature control the activity of the hands. So commanding that we find pleasure and honor in obeying, the faith should blend with the light of rising and of setting suns, with the flying cloud, the singing bird, and the breath of flowers. But now the priest's Sabbath has lost the splendor of nature, it is unlovely. We, had, we are glad when it is done. We can make, we, can, we do make, even sitting in our pews, a far better, holier, sweeter for ourselves. Whenever the pulpit is usurped by a formalist, then is the worshiper defrauded and disconsolate. We shrink as soon as the prayers begin, which do not uplift but smite and offend us. We are fain to wrap our cloaks about us and secure as best we can a solitude that hears not. I once heard a preacher who sorely tempted me to say I would go to church no more. <laughs> uh, I've had a few of those. <laughs> Men go, thought I, where they are wont to go, else had no soul entered the temple in the afternoon. A snowstorm was falling around us. The snowstorm was real. The preacher merely spec <clears throat> the preacher merely spectral. And the eye felt the sad contrast in looking at him. And then, out of the window behind him, into the beautiful meteor of the snow. He had lived in vain. He had no one word intimating that he had laughed or wept, was married or in love, had been commended or cheated or chagrined. If he had ever lived and acted, we were none the wiser for it. The capital secret of his profession, namely to convert life into truth, he had not learned. Not one fact in all his experience had he yet imported into his doctrine. This man had plowed, planted, and talked, and bought, and sold. He had read books, he had eaten and drunken. His head aches, his heart throbs, he smiles and suffers. Yet was there not a surmise, a hint, in all the discourse that he had ever lived his life? Life passed through the fire of thought, but of the bad preacher, it could not be told from his sermon. What age of the world he fell in, whether he had a father or a child, whether he was a freeholder or a pauper, whether he was a citizen or a countryman, or any other fact of his biography. It seemed strange that the people should come to church it seemed as if their houses were very unentertaining, <laughs> that they should prefer this thoughtless clamor. 
<laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I, ha I certainly have experienced many preachers like that. It shows that there is a commanding attraction in the moral sentiment that can lend a faint tint of light to dullness and ignorance coming in its name and place. The good hearer is sure he has been touched sometimes, is sure there is somewhat to be reached, and some word that can reach it. When he listens to these vain words, he, comf he comforts himself by their relation to his remembrance of better hours, and so they clatter and echo unchallenged. <clears throat> Sorry for my <laughs> mirth. You can imagine these uh, divinity school students graduating <laughs> at Harvard Divinity School and hearing these words. It must have been a real hoot. <laughs> uh, that's what I. That's why I put oh my O M G at the beginning of the title of this live stream. <laughs> Screen because they surely must have thinking, oh my God, what have I gotten into? I am not ignorant that when we preach unworthily, it is not always quite in vain. There is a good ear in some men that draws supplies to virtue out of very indifferent nutriment. There is poetic truth concealed in all the commonplaces of prayer and of sermons, and though foolishly spoken, they may be wisely heard, for each is some select expression that broke out in the moment of piety from some stricken or jubilant soul, and its excellency made it remember. The prayers and even the dogmas of our church are like the zodiac of Dendera, and the astronomical monuments of the Hindus, wholly insulated from anything now extant in the life and business of the people. They mark the height to which the waters once rose, but this docility is a check upon the mischief from the good and devout. In a large portion of the community, the religious service gives rise to quite other thoughts and emotions. We need not chide the negligent servant. We are struck with pity, rather, at the swift retribution of his sloth. Alas for the unhappy man that is called to stand in the pulpit and not give bread of life. Everything that befalls accuses him. Would he ask contributions for the missions, foreign or domestic? Instantly his face is suffused with shame to propose to his parish that they should send money a hundred or a thousand miles to furnish such poor fare as they have at home and would do well to go to the hundred or a thousand miles to escape. Would he urge people to, to a godly way of living? And can he ask a fellow creature to come to Sabbath meetings when he and they all know what is poor uttermost they can hope for therein. Will he invite them privately to the Lord's Supper? He dares not. If no heart warm this right, the hollow, dry, creaking formality is too plain than that he can face a man of wit and energy and put the invitation without terror. In the street, what has he to say to the bold village blasphemer? The village blasphemer sees fear in the face, form, and gait of the minister. Let me not taint the sincerity of this plea by any oversight of the claims of good men. I know and honor the purity and strict conscious, conscience of numbers of the clergy. What life the public worship retains, it owes to the scattered company of pious men 
who minister here and there in the churches, and who, sometimes accepting with too great tenderness the tenant of the elders, have not accepted from others, but from their own heart the genuine impulses of virtue, and, still, and so still command our love and awe to the sanctity of character. Moreover, the exceptions are not so much to be found in a few eminent preachers as in the better hours, the truer inspirations of all. Nay, in the superior, nay, in the sincere moments of every man. But with whatever exception, it is still true that tradition characterizes the preaching of this country, that it comes out of the memory and not out of the soul that it aims at what is usual and not what is necessary and eternal, that thus historical Christianity destroys the power of preaching by withdrawing it from the exploration of the moral nature of man, where the sublime is, where are the resources of astonishment and power. What a cruel injustice it is to that law, the joy of the whole earth, which alone can make thought dear and rich. That law, whose fatal sureness the astronomical orbits poorly emulate, that it is transvestied and depreciated, that it is behooted and behowled, and not a trait, not a word of it articulated. The pulpit, in losing sight of this law, loses its reason and gropes after it knows not what and for want of this culture the soul of the community is sick and faithless it wants nothing so much as a stern high stoical christian discipline to make it know itself in the divinity that speaks through it now man is shame ashamed of himself he skulks and sneaks through the world to be tolerated to be pitied and scarcely in a thousand years does any man dare to be wise and good, and so draw after him the tears and blessings of his kind. I, I wrote in the margin of this <laughs> right here. Uh, I could just hear the graduates thinking, what have I done? <laughs> anyway. Paragon, page 14 of 19. <clears throat> Certainly there have been periods when, from the inactivity of the intellect on certain truths, a greater faith was possible in names and persons. The Puritans in England and America found in the Christ of the Catholic Church and in the dogmas inherited from Rome scope for their austere piety and their longings for civil freedom. But their creed is passing away, and none arises in its room. I think no man can go with his thoughts about him into one of our churches without feeling that what hold the public worship had on men is gone or going. It has lost its grasp on the affection of the good and the fear of the bad. In the country neighborhoods, Half parishes are signing off, to use the local term. It is already beginning to indicate character and religion to withdraw from the religious meetings. I have heard a devout person who prized the Sabbath say in, bit, say in bitterness of heart, quote, on Sundays, it seems wicked to go to church, unquote. And the motive that holds the best there is now only a hope and a waiting. What was once a mere circumstance that the best and the worst men in the parish, the poor and the rich, the learned and the ignorant, young and old, should meet one day as fellows in one house in sign of an equal right in the soul, has come to be a paramount motive for going thither. My friends, in these two errors, I think I find the cause of a decaying church and a wasteful and a wasting unbelief. 
And what greater calamity can fall upon a nation than the loss of worship? Then all things go to decay. Genius leaves the temple to haunt the senate or the market. Literature becomes frivolous. Science is cold. The eye of youth is not lighted by the hope of other worlds, and the and age is without honor. Society lives to trifles, and when men die, we do not mention them. And now, my brothers, you will ask, what in these desponding days can be done by us? The remedy is already declared in the ground of our complaint of the church. We have contrasted the church with the soul. In the soul, then, let the, rep let the redemption be sought. Whenever a man comes, there comes revolution. The old is for slaves. When a man comes, all books are legible all things transparent, all religions are forms. He is religious. Man is a wonder worker. He is seen amid miracles. All men bless and curse. He saith yea and nay only. The stationariness of religion, the assumption that the age of inspiration is past, that the Bible is closed, the fear of degrading the character of Jesus by representing him as a man indicate with sufficient clearness the falsehood of our theology. It is the office of the true teacher to show us that God is, not was, that he speaketh, not spake. The true Christianity, a faith like Christ's in the infinitude of man, is lost. None believeth in the soul of man but only in some man or person old and departed. O oh me, no man goeth alone. All men go in flocks to this saint or that poet, avoiding the God who seeth in secret. They cannot see in secret. They love to be blind in public. They think society wiser than their soul, and know not that one soul and their soul is wiser than the whole world. See how nations and races flit by on the sea of time. See how nations and races flit by on the sea of time and leave no ripple to tell where they floated or sunk and one good soul shall make the name of Moses or of Zeno or of Zoroaster reverend forever none essayeth the stern ambition to be the self of the nation and of nature, but each would be an easy secondary to some Christian scheme or sectarian connection or some eminent man. Once leave your own knowledge of God, your own sentiment, and take secondary knowledge as St. Paul's, as George Fox's or Swedenborg's, and you get wide from God with every year the secondary form lasts. And if, as now, for centuries the chasm yawns to that breadth, that men can scarcely be convinced there is in them anything divine. Let me admonish you, first of all, to go alone, to refuse the good models, even those which are sacred in the imagination of men, and dare to love God without mediator or veil. Friends enough you shall find who will hold up your emulation, Wesley's and Oberlin's, saints and prophets. Thank God for these men, but say, I also am a man. Imitation can go above its model. I'm sorry, imitation cannot go above its model. The imitator dooms himself to hopeless mediocrity. The inventor did it because it was natural to him, and so in him it has a charm. In the imitator, something else is natural, and he bereaves himself of his own beauty to come short of another man's. Yourself a newborn bard of the Holy Ghost, cast behind you all conformity, and equate men at first hand with deity. 
look to it first and only, that fashion, custom, authority, pleasure, and money are nothing to you, are not bandages over your eyes that you cannot see, but live with the privilege of the immeasurable mind, not too anxious to visit periodically all families and each family in your parish connection. When you meet one of these men or women, be to them a divine man. Be to them thought and virtue. Let their timid aspirations find in you a friend. Let their trampled instincts be genially tempted out in your atmosphere. Let your doubts know that you have doubted and their wonder feel that you have wondered. By trusting your own heart, you shall gain more confidence in other men. For all our penny, for all our penny wisdom, for all our soul-destroying slavery to habit, it is not to be doubted that all men have sublime thoughts, that all men value the real hours of life. They love to be heard. They love to be caught up in the, into the vision of principles. We mark with light in the memory the view inter we we mark with light in the memory the few interviews we have had in the dreary years of routine and of sin with souls that made our souls wiser, that spoke what we thought, that told us what we knew, that gave us leave to be what we that gave us leave to be what we inly were, discharged to men the priestly office, and present or absent, you shall be followed with their love as by an angel. <clears throat> and to this end, let us not aim at common degrees of merit. Can we not leave to such as love it? the virtue that glitters for the commendation of society and ourselves pierce the deep solitudes of absolute ability and worth. We easily come up to the standard of goodness in society. Society's praise can be cheaply secured, and almost all men are content with those easy merits. But the instant effect of conversing with God will be to put them away. There are persons who are not actors, not speakers, but influences, persons too great for fame, for display, who disdain eloquence, to whom all we call art and artist seems too nearly allied to show and buy ends, to the exaggeration of the finite and selfish, the loss of the universal, the orators, the poets, the commanders encroach on us only as fair women do, by our allowance and homage. Slight them by preoccupation of mind. Slight them, as you can well afford to do, by high and universal aims, and they instantly feel that you have right, and that it is in lower places that they must shine. They also feel your right, for they with you are open to the influx of the all-knowing spirit, which annihilates before its broad noon the little shades and gradations of intelligence in the compositions we call wiser and wisest. In such high communion, let us study the grand strokes of rectitude, a bold benevolence and independence of friends, so that not the unjust wishes of those who love us shall impair our freedom, but we shall resist for truth's sake the freest flow of kindness and appeal to sympathies far in advance, and what is the highest form in which we know this beautiful element, a certain solidity of merit that has nothing to do with opinion, and which is so essentially and manifestly true that it is taken for granted that the right, the brave, the generous, step will be taken by it, and nobody thinks of commending it. You would compliment a coxcomb 
doing a good act, but you would not praise an angel. The silence that accepts merit as the most natural thing in the world is the highest applause. Such souls, when they appear, are the, imper are the imperial guard of virtue, the perpetual reserve, the dictators of fortune. One needs not praise their courage. They are the heart and soul of nature. O oh, my friends, there are resources in us on which we have not drawn. They are men who rise refreshed on hearing a threat, men to whom a crisis which intimidates and paralyzes the majority, demanding not the faculties of prudence and thrift, but comprehension, immovableness, and readiness to sacrifice, comes graceful and beloved as a bride. Napoleon said of Messina, that he was not himself until the battle began to go against him. Then, when the dead began to fall in ranks around him, awoke his powers of combination, and he put on terror and victory as a robe. So it is in rugged crises, in unweariable endurance, and in aims which put sympathy out of question, that the angel is shown. But these are heights that we can scarce remember and look up to. Without contrition and shame, let us thank God that such things exist. And now let us do what we can to, re to rekindle the smoldering, nigh-quenched fire on the altar. The evils of the church that is now manifest, the question returns, what shall we do? I confess all attempts to project and establish a cultus with new rites and forms seem to me vain. Faith makes us, and not we it, and faith makes its own forms. All attempts to contrive a system are as called as the all attempts to contrive a system are as cold as the new worship introduced by the French of the goddess of reason. Today, pasteboard and filigree, and ending tomorrow in madness and murder. Rather, let the breath of new life be breathed by you through the forms already existing. For if once you are alive, you shall find they shall become plastic and new. The remedy to their deformity is first soul, second, soul, evermore, soul. A whole popedom of forms, one pulsation of virtue, can uplift and vivify. One inestimable, ad two inestimable advantages Christianity has given us. First, the Sabbath, the jubilee of the whole world, whose light dawns welcome alike in the closet of the philosopher, into the garret of toil, and into prison cells, and everywhere suggests, even to the vile, the dignity of spiritual being. Let it stand forevermore a temple, which new love, new faith, new sight shall restore to more than its first splendor to mankind. And secondly, the institution of preaching, the speech of man to men, essentially the most flexible of all organs, of all forms. What hinders that now everywhere in pulpits, in lecture rooms, in houses, in fields, wherever the invitation of men of your own occasions lead you, you speak the very truth as your life and conscience teach it and cheer the waiting, fainting hearts of men with new hope and new revelation. I look for the hour. I look for the hour when that supreme beauty which ravished the souls of those Eastern men and chiefly of those Hebrews and through their lips spoke oracle, oracles to all time shall speak in the West also the Hebrew and Greek scriptures 
contain immortal sentences that have been bred to life to millions, but they have no epical integrity, are fragmentary, are not shown in their order to the intellect. I look for the new teacher that shall follow so far those shining laws, that he shall see them come full circle, shall see their rounding complete grace, shall see the world to be the mirror of the soul, shall see the identity of the law of gra gravitation with purity of heart, and shall show that the ought, that duty, is one thing, and shall show that ought, that duty, is one thing with science, with beauty, and with joy. I guess I'll try to read that again. Very me. <clears throat> I look for the new teacher that shall follow so far those shining laws that he shall see them come full circle, shall see their rounding complete grace, shall see the world to be the mirror of the soul shall see the identity of the law of gravitation with purity of heart, and shall show that the ought, that duty, is one thing with science, with beauty, and with joy. So, at least that was moving to me. I don't know if it was moving to you, but that is the... Um, that is the commencement address of... Ralph Waldo Emerson to the graduating class of the Divinity School at Harvard University. Now, there are a few things that I thought I would point out here, and I will put a copy of this in the Dropbox for today uh, in the general Dropbox, so it'll be um, uh, 0221.19 will be the will be in handouts in the general Dropbox. Now one thing I wanted to point or a couple of things I wanted to point out. Um, one is that on page three, uh, the description he gives about natural law is basically the law of karma as it appears in Buddhism. Two, um, where He's again on page three uh, talking about what lies do. And, and I think that he's right about that. Uh, next, uh, his point that love is never outgrown, that's important. Uh, and then he emphasizes experience. So now he's talking basically about Gnostic ideas don't go to um, the water jar, go to the fountain, go directly to God from yourself and um, have the experience directly yourself. Don't let a middleman do it for you. And um, next I'd point out that he's talking about individuation in the context of what Dr. Jung taught a century later. And um, he talks in terms of a new revelation. And, um, and I think it's very interesting that here in 1838, so nearly 200 years ago, he's saying the, co the church seems to totter to its fall almost like almost all life is extinct in the church. So he was perceiving that in the context of early America, um, the first hundred years. And let's see what my other notes here suggest. 
I already said that <laughs> these, these divinity school students must have been saying, oh my God. <laughs> and uh, also he was talking about uh, the, uh, the collective and the dangers of the collective, which is obviously something uh, Dr. Jung picked up 80 years later and others had done. Um, and again, there's more material here that seems Gnostic and based on uh, experience, direct experience with God rather than with intermediation by a, by a pastor. And that's why he was emphasizing the fact that preaching uh, should be um, based on one's personal experience rather than some formulaic thing because if if you can express your personal experience then you can convey something uh, to a person but just telling them isn't going to necessarily do do anything and i i can't tell you how many sermons i've slept through in my lifetime but plenty anyway okay so um, that's all I had to do for today, and that was long enough, but I feel um, righteous <laughs> because I've read it, um, and, um, and I, ju I just think that there, you know, there's a lot of things that Dr. Jung picked up later that are already in uh, Dr. Emerson's ideas here, and, um, you know, Dr. Jung picked up on them. They must have been in the, in the air at that time, nearly a hundred years before Dr. Jung was doing his main writing, and, um, <clears throat> uh, so, anyway, I guess that'll be all for today, hearing no other comments, uh, and uh, I will immediately put this PDF in, a, in the Dropbox uh, subfolder called O2-2119 under Handouts in the general Dropbox. So uh, I'll look forward to seeing you again sometime soon.